Hi, I'm Alex Berenson. I'm a former reporter for the New York Times and the author of the book, Tell Your Children, The Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence. I've spoken to Hillsdale audiences about that in the past. I'm here today to talk to you about the coronavirus, our modeling of it, and what the failure of the most important models we've used to predict the course of the virus mean and what they should tell us about lockdowns and our strategy going forward. So let's talk a little bit about models and what they are and why they're important uh, at, the, you know, at the most basic level. Uh, the coronavirus is a, is a novel illness. It's a novel virus. There are other kinds of coronaviruses, but when this one emerged uh, in China in January 2020, we didn't have very much idea about what it was, how dangerous it might be, um, medically and you know at a cellular level how it affected people but though the the medical and biological issues are are sort of outside of my domain i'm i'm more interested in the um the sort of herd level the population level effects that we're trying to to figure out um you know i'm not a molecular biologist i wouldn't pretend to know how the coronavirus infects a cell on the you know on the most basic cellular level but i can tell you um whether or not the predictions that are made about the transmissibility of the virus and the um, the ultimate population effects of the virus are what we're seeing in reality. That's that doesn't require a PhD in molecular biology. It just requires the ability to compare different sets of numbers and track them in real time, um, which is really what I've been doing for the last month or so. So models matter. Why do they matter? They matter because. People are using them you know, in, in hospital systems at state levels, at national levels, at international levels to figure out how many people might become sick from the coronavirus, how many people might need ventilators or ICU beds from the coronavirus, how many people might die from the coronavirus. Um, obviously, if 10% of the population is going to die, uh, you know, we need to take really drastic steps. If one in 1,000 people is gonna die, uh, perhaps the coronavirus is more like the flu and we can treat it more like the flu. So we need to know uh, where the epidemic is going to go in the days and weeks before it gets there, or that's certainly what we're hoping to do. And the models help us get there. And the science of epidemiology and infectious disease uh, has been around a long time. It's been, uh, it's been really developing for more than a century and a half. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a lot, and, and epidemics come and go over time. So there's a lot of history here. There's a lot to draw on here. So when people are talking about models, what are they talking about? They're talking about trying to predict the course of the epidemic in the coming weeks, months, you know, ideally years, although as you go further and further out, it becomes harder and harder to predict. How do you do that? Well, you need some basic facts about the virus. You need to know how transmissible it is. In other words, if I get sick, how many people on average am I going to sicken? Um, you know, if, if I'm only gonna sicken one person, the virus, the, the epidemic is going to spread slowly. If I'm going to sicken 20 people, as actually can be the case in the case of something like measles, the epidemic is going to spread very rapidly. Um, we also want to know how quickly that transmission cycle takes place. How many days am I likely to be infectious? How many days am I likely to be infectious before I know I'm infectious, before I'm showing symptoms? That's a crucial variable. Um, it, just to give you an example of how big the uncertainties can be here, if the R, the transmissibility, is two, meaning one person infects two other people, and the cycle is six days, uh, over the course of a month, one infection might become 30 infections, which, you know, that's, that's obviously a big change. But if the R is three, one person is sickening three people, or a little bit more than three, uh, 3.1 to be precise, uh, and, and the transmission cycle is four days, over that same month, one person can sicken, or it's not that one person will sicken 10,000 people, but one infection will become 10,000 infections. So an R of three, a transmission cycle of four, one becomes 10,000. An R of two, a transmission cycle of six days, an R becomes a bit more than 30 over the course of a month. These are huge differences. And, on four, and so, so that's one thing. We need to know how fast the virus spreads. We need to know where it goes. We'd like to really know what, what vectors are most likely to spread it. In other words, are children spreading this to adults or adults spreading this to children? Does this spread if we're outside just in talking to people or does it require pretty close contact? Uh, you know, is in-home transmission the main method of transmission? Is transmission on public transportation the main method? 
Um, these are these are more subtle questions, but they're they're also crucially important in terms of dev uh, devising a societal response. Um, and we want to know: Can the R change? How quickly? You know, what might drive R up or lower it? Does a does a hard lockdown lower it very fast? Does moderate social distancing lower it very fast? Those are those are you know again those are sort of second level questions. Before you can even get to those, you need to know the basics about transmissibility and the reproductive cycle of the virus. And again, some of that depends on the biological characteristics of the virus, which are you know which scientists in labs all over the world are trying to figure out. But some of those depend on, uh, for lack of a better word, the sociological characteristics of what we're doing. Are we pushing people into emergency rooms? Are there, is there a Mardi Gras event where you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people are getting together for a parade? All of those things are not actually so much about the virus as about us. And so they can change very rapidly, more rapidly actually than the, than the fundamental characteristics of the virus. So, that, so, so, so transmissibility is one key number. And then the other key number is the fatality rate. Um, the, well, the hospitalization rate, but ultimately the fatality rate of the virus. How many people who get this are going to get sick? And, and how many of those people are going to die? And, and obviously, again, a virus that kills, and you know, something like Ebola might kill half the people it infects. Something like HIV, uh, before there were antiretrovirals, would kill 100% of the people it infected. Uh, you know, with a you know, with a with a very unusual exception or two, everybody who got HIV ultimately died um, of of AIDS. So some viruses are extremely lethal. Uh, other viruses, like the flu, much less the common cold, are much less lethal. Um, and so the and the spectrum really can be anywhere from zero uh, to a hundred percent. And early on, as you're as you're figuring out, as you're trying to um, figure out. Uh, these models, you may not have great information about the fatality rate. You're making some guesses. And that was really very true in this case because a lot of the data was coming out of China. And I would say, you know, people are pretty suspicious even now of some of the data uh, that, that the Chinese government has reported. Um, you know, it's not entirely clear that they were counting cases accurately. They kept changing the definitions of cases. Um, you know, there are people who don't believe the fatality numbers that they reported, the death numbers that they reported. Uh, you know, I, I don't really, I try not to engage in conspiracy theory, uh, but, you know, China is in a, an authoritarian state, and uh, I do think there are, there are legitimate questions about the data that came out of China in the first month. Um, so the people who are, who, are, who are charting these models, who are creating these models, especially in March as the, as the epidemic spread, you know, outside of China to Europe and then to the United States, were doing so with somewhat limited information, and they had to make guesses. Uh, and when you're making these models, I think there's a natural tendency probably to want not to err on the side of underestimating the danger. Uh, you do, so if you, if, you, if you overestimate the danger, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you cause problems with the economy or, or, or other problems that you know, these people who are making the models don't necessarily focus on. But if you underestimate the data, uh, people die is, is, I think is sort of the, so the bias tends to be to overestimate the risk here. Um, and so again, you need to, we all should remember that as these models were being created, uh, uh, we didn't have great data about either the transmissibility or the infection fatality rate. Um, and by the way, the infection fatality rate can change too. It can change for a number of reasons. It can change if we get pharmaceutical interventions. So, uh, you know, people, people have talked about antiviral drugs uh, or, you know, or zinc and z -packs and HCQ. Um, and it's not clear, by the way, that any of those interventions actually work. They need to be tested in placebo-controlled trials where they're tested against uh, basically nothing so we can see if they're better or worse than nothing because making guesses on the basis of anecdotes is not a good idea. But over time, you would expect and hope that physicians will come up with treatments for these, uh, you know, for uh, the coronavirus that will reduce the fatality rate. Um, another, another, and there may be, uh, you know, physical interventions, like literally just having people lie on their stomachs. It's called proning them. That appears to actually help some people um, not become too, uh, not need to go on ventilators, not become too oxygen deprived. And so physicians learn and they learn quickly 
Um, and but at the same time, we need to make sure that they're not just going on anecdotes. So it's so it's a very complicated process. But the infection fatality rate can change, um, and and it can change the other way. Uh, you know, I think there's increasing evidence and increasing debate in the medical community about the use of ventilators and whether whether if you overuse ventilators, you might wind up hurting some people uh, because of some specific characteristics of the way the coronavirus affects the lungs. And so. Ultimately, if you use ventilators too aggressively, you might even wind up killing some people who might otherwise have survived. Um, and that's, you know, that it's a very tricky balance. Uh, for, you know, I, I, I'm not a physician. My wife is a physician, and uh, she actually treats COVID patients. And, and I'm very respectful of the, um, of the choices that physicians have to make in some of these cases with very limited information. But the point is the infection fatality rate can change, and so can the R. Okay, so that's... That's what the people who are creating the models, those are the limitations they're facing. And it's a little bit, think of it a little bit like a hurricane prediction. At some point, if you have too many uncertainties, the prediction is just useless. So if, if I'm predicting that a hurricane might hit Miami on a Tuesday in August, and it might be a category three to category five, that's a, you know, and, and I know the date, it's, you know, Tuesday, August 21st, I'm just making that date up. But, uh, you know, it might be Miami, or it might be uh, Fort Lauderdale, or it might be, you know, a little bit further north. That's a good enough prediction that we can do something with that. We can evacuate South Florida. We can say to people, we don't know that this is going to be the worst thing ever, but it could be. And even if it's not, it's going to cause some problems. So let's let's get you know let's get people in South Florida out of of Miami. Let's get them you know let's get them to some place that's a little bit safer. If my prediction is that there's going to be a hurricane sometime in August that's going to hit somewhere between Miami and New York City. And uh, it might be a category one, or it might be a category three, or it might be a category five. That's useless. And it's especially useless if my uh, policy prescription as a result of that prescription or that prediction is not just, hey, we need to evacuate the whole Atlantic seaboard, but let's burn the whole seaboard down. And to some extent, that is the you know that is the choice that we've made with these lockdowns. So so at some point, the prediction becomes too nebulous to be of any use, no matter how well intentioned it is. Um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, what is obvious when I when I use the hurricane analogy was not obvious last month when we were talking about these models. So the first model that really grabbed a lot of attention came out on March sixteenth. And it came out from Imperial College in London. And what it said was that 2 million people in the United States and 500,000 people in Britain would probably die from the coronavirus if no steps were taken. And that even if pretty aggressive mitigation, as the authors called it, was used, the deaths would be at roughly half that level. So more than a million in the US, a quarter million in Britain. Now, the, the people who, who did this uh, were led by a professor named Neil Ferguson, uh, who's a British professor, who's um, you know a very well-respected epidemiologist. I think what was forgotten at the time, although it's become, uh, I don't want to say obvious, but it's become noticed uh, since, is that Professor Ferguson has a long history of making very aggressive predictions about death and uh, from from epidemics. Uh, he predicted in 2005 that as many as 200 million people might die from the bird flu that was, uh, that was around that year. He predicted in uh, 2001 that uh, as more than 100,000 people in Britain might die from mad cow disease. And he also predicted that it might leap to sheep and create mad sheep disease. Um, and that at ultimately 150,000 people might die. Now, uh, obviously those estimates turned out not to be the case. Uh, but nonetheless, when the Imperial College model came out, it was very, it received tremendous attention in both the US and the UK. And, uh, you know, the New York Times actually wrote a story, a front page story on March 17th, talking about the impact that the model had had on policymakers in the US and the UK. And, and I'd been paying attention to the coronavirus pretty aggressively since, uh, since early, or, or not, not, not early, since late January, since um, you know, the, the numbers sort of came out of China. And I, and I was concerned about it. And I would say that I was a little puzzled in late February because we didn't see the epidemics, the secondary epidemics in other China megacities that, that were being predicted 
after the initial Wuhan epidemic. We didn't see Beijing get overrun. We didn't see Shanghai get overrun. Uh, you know, the epidemic seemed weirdly confined to Wuhan and, uh, or, you know, and Hubei province. And these other cities, even after they began to, you know, reduce their lockdowns and quarantines, they didn't show huge spikes. So, so that puzzled me. But then, of course, Italy, northern Italy, especially the hospitals, faced uh, terrible damage. And that was, you know, that was very scary. And then the, uh, the, the, you know, the paper came out on March 16th. And I think I read it that night. And what really struck me was the age stratification in the data, meaning um, people over 70 and certainly people over 80, uh, account for the majority, people over 70 account for the vast majority of coronavirus deaths. People over 80 account for the majority. My best estimate is that worldwide, more people over 100 have died than under 30, believe it or not. Um, and more people over 90 have died than under 50. Uh, so this is, a, this is an epidemic that is really, really stratified by age, that the, the, your risks are much, much higher if you're older, which doesn't mean it's not serious. And it doesn't mean that the deaths of people over 80 or 90 don't matter. But it does, it does suggest that the, the virus itself is not so terribly dangerous if it isn't hurting younger people. Um, uh, you know, it's not the Spanish flu, which, you know, which, which, which killed a lot of children, a lot of young adults, and a lot of older people. Um, so the you know so the Spanish flu analogy probably isn't a great analogy. So so I looked at the at the Imperial College data and Imperial College was very explicit about this that to get numbers down to some reasonable level we were going to have to suppress uh, the they use the term suppression suppress society for a very long time. They said eighteen months, but if you actually read the paper. It may, the paper makes clear that 18 months is just essentially a number that they're using to say it might take 18 months to get to a vaccine. And if we, you know, basically until we get to a vaccine, suppression is going to have to continue if we don't want these terrible death tolls to mount, you know, a million people in the U.S., a quarter million in the U.K. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that scared people. Even, you know, I think, I think the top line number got a lot of attention, understandably, and people focused less on the age stratification and the, you know the, the the big gap in risk by age, um, so so then what happened was uh, I believe it was March twenty third, uh, Neil Ferguson um, uh, gave testimony to Parliament, and he said, well, uh, you know our new best estimate is twenty thousand deaths in Britain um, with a, with a couple of weeks of lockdown, and and that got some attention in the UK. It didn't get any attention in the U.S., um, where, where attention was becoming very, very focused on what was happening in New York City and the death counts in, you know, and the hospitalizations in New York City, and Governor Cuomo predicting that we might need as many as 140,000 uh, beds here in New York State, hospital beds, as many as 30 to 40,000 ventilators. Really terrifying stories coming out in the New York Times about how, um, you know, a million people might need to be on ventilators, uh, which one Times reporter then said meant that a million ventilators might be needed, which was an absurd statement in, under any circumstance because uh, a ventilator is useless without the trained uh, you know, nurses and doctors and medical staff to run it. And so there's no circumstance under which a million ventilators ever made any sense. But, um, but going back to Britain and to Professor Ferguson, Professor Ferguson, who by this time had actually uh, uh, contacted uh, the coronavirus himself, been infected with the coronavirus, get, suddenly changed his estimate to 20,000. And uh, he did this, um, uh, again, it wasn't quiet. It was, uh, it, was, it was before a parliamentary hearing in the UK, but it didn't get very much attention. And he said, well, we think the transmissibility has gone, is higher than we thought. So, so what does that mean? Well, if the transmissibility is higher, that means a much larger group of people have gotten this over the course of the last couple of months than we realized. And that's a good thing. The more people who've gotten it, that means that the number of people walking around with no symptoms at all is higher than we think. And that means that the virus is less dangerous than we think. And if, 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 if 10 million people are infected and 10,000 ultimately die, that's a one in 1,000 death rate. That's like the flu. Um, if, if, if 100,000 people get it, and 10,000 die, that's a 10% death rate. That's nothing like the flu. That's much, much worse. Um, and so, and in that case, we have to be terrified that ultimately, you know, those 10 million people will get it and a million of those will die. Uh, but what, what, what Professor Ferguson was saying was, we think more people have gotten this and therefore, it, it, just doing the math, 
it can't be as dangerous as we thought, although he didn't explicitly come out and say that. Uh, so I pointed this out in a couple of tweets uh, the next day once I realized what he had said. And, um, and that's really, that was about a month ago, that's really when I started to become uh, you know, a little bit of a, uh, people call me a contrarian or a skeptic on this. Uh, I think I'm just trying to point to data that, you know, that other, that other outlets may not be pointing to. Um, but so, so Professor Ferguson then said, well, we didn't really change our model. 500,000, 250,000, 20,000, all those numbers are in our model. And that is true. They're all in there. But what he didn't say was that he had fundamentally changed the assumptions around the model, uh, around the, around the deaths, around the 20,000 death figure. Whereas before the assumptions, and I'm talking about in the paper, you can see it in the paper, the assumptions are we need, again, 18 months of suppression to get to uh, 20,000 deaths. Even if we have just a few months of mitigation of, of somewhat severe societal measures, but not a full lockdown, we're going to have a quarter million deaths. All of a sudden he's saying, well, with just a couple of weeks of lockdown, I think we're at 20,000 deaths. And he also said explicitly, most of those people will be, uh, will be elderly, or quite sick, or in uh, and have less than a year to live. They would have died anyway by the end of the year. I think was his phrase. I, I, I can check that. Um, and so, so you know, he said twenty thousand deaths in the UK was the most likely estimate. And again, most of those people already um, already old, you know, already would have died quite soon anyway. And so again, I pointed this out. Uh, he then responded not directly to me. But you know, he was responding uh, clearly to the fact that I had pointed this out and said, "Oh, well, we didn't really change anything." And there were, you know, there were some media outlets that effectively accepted that narrative, and nobody seemed to go back and say, "Well, Professor Ferguson, what about all these other times when you've, you know, vastly overstated estimates for death counts?" Um, so that, so, so, so the Imperial College model was the model that really grabbed attention in the U.S. and the U.K. and really pushed policymakers into a lockdown, into lockdown mode. I mean, it, it certainly got the attention of the White House and it started this, uh, you know, this sort of domino effect where uh, first some states on the West Coast, uh, you know, locked down and then New York said they weren't going to and then they did and then more and more states followed. And, uh, you know, there was increasing national pressure for the few states by, you know, by I would say the end of March, the, the last week of March, the states that hadn't locked down yet were feeling um, you know, considerable media pressure and some uh, public slash political pressure to lock down, and most of them ultimately did. Uh, so, so the Imperial College model, um, uh, you know, was changed in a way that uh, that that again, if you read the original paper, it's clear that change that you know that that it was changed, and I I don't. I don't think that anybody who reads with a with a fair mind could could uh, could dispute that. But but actually, the model that has become more important in the U.S. and and is even and is and is more provably wrong and more consequentially wrong in the last month is the University of Washington model. Okay, so what is the University of Washington model? Well, uh, on on March 26th, the University of Washington uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation released a very detailed model state by state, and actually they've extended it to many countries, saying this is how many beds, hospital beds, we think states are going to need. This is how many uh, uh, ventilators states are going to need. This is how many um, uh, uh, deaths we're going to have. And so, and so this became a guide to state planning. And what the March 26th model showed was that all states practically, but especially New York State, were in terrible trouble. And, and so, and so, and New York State, uh, I believe the, uh, the, the one of the, or maybe the second iteration of the model, what the prediction was, it was going to need 76,000 hospital beds um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and tens of thousands of ventilators. Um, and that actually wasn't as bad as the state's own projections, which again were as many as 140,000 hospital beds and 30,000 ventilators, 30 to 40,000 ventilators. Okay, and, 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 in, and in many other states, the predictions were quite, you know, they were extremely high. Ultimately, I think the, you know, the, the April 5th version of this uh, predicted 260,000 hospital beds needed nationally, which is, a, you know, an enormous number. Okay, so where did this come from? Here's what happened in New York City 
around, you need to understand what happened in New York City from March, about March 15th to March 25th. Uh, hospitalizations increased dramatically. They increased almost tenfold. So, uh, you know, uh, in mid-March, there were 100 people showing up with COVID-related illness uh, in New York City hospitals or being hospitalized. By uh, March 25th, that number was over 1,000. Okay. And the key metric here is hospitalizations. Why? Because deaths are a lagging indicator. And by the way, right now in the United States, because the death coding is so, I would say, aggressive and loose, um, it's not even clear, you know, in some cases, people who didn't even have uh, the coronavirus might be counted as a coronavirus-related death at the same time in places that are really badly, you know, that were really badly impacted, which basically means New York City. It's possible that there were some people who died who weren't counted um, even though they did die of coronavirus. So, so the death counts are complicated. Hospitalizations are a, are a better metric for the most part because no good doctor is going to hospitalize somebody uh, you know, for coronavirus or anything else who doesn't need to be hospitalized. So here's, here's, here's the crucial part of this. You become infected with coronavirus. It takes several days before you develop symptoms. On average, about five days. Some people develop more rapidly. Some people it takes longer. Then you get worse over time. And over a period of days, five days, six days, seven days, ultimately you, you, you get sick enough that you're in the hospital. And from there, you, oftentimes you progress pretty rapidly. You, you, know, you might wind up in the ICU uh, or on a ventilator, or you might, you, know, you might die. Or in some cases, many cases actually, you, don't, you, know, you, you, you feel better after a day or two in the hospital and you're discharged. Okay. So, but the main thing is there's a lag. There's a lag between infection and symptoms, symptoms and hospitalization. In New York City, the lockdowns, uh, I believe it was the state, uh, Governor Cuomo announced the lockdowns on, I want to say, uh, Friday, March 21st, and they were to take effect on March 23rd, Sunday, March 23rd. What people were afraid of and what the models essentially predicted was that the lockdowns occurred too late, okay? And that in the 10-day period before the lockdowns took place, there, was go there had been a massive surge in hospitalizations and that surge was gonna continue, I'm sorry, a massive surge in infections, in fact, day after day infections increasing and those increased infections were gonna lead to a massive wave of hospitalizations that wasn't gonna peak on March 25th, because that's too close to the lockdown, but that was gonna continue the increase, increase day after day after day until five or six or 7,000 people a day were being hospitalized for this. Uh, you know, and, and the hospitals were not gonna be able to cope with this. And that, that was what was terrifying to people, that not that the lockdowns were, were, uh, were going to work, but that the lockdowns weren't going to work because they'd taken place too late. That is the core assumption at, you know, even though it's not explicitly stated, it is the core assumption in the University of Washington model, certainly for New York State. But what happened wasn't that at all. What happened was that hospitalization stayed relatively high for several days, um, really 10 or more days following that March 25th date, but they didn't continue to increase exponentially. And so every day the models got a little bit more wrong. So by, 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 you know, early April, the models were predicting, or I shouldn't say the models, there's one model, it's the University of Washington model. They're predicting that, that as many as 60,000 people would need hospitalizations in New York State. But in reality, the number was more like 15,000. And, and the gap continued to increase. And so looking at that, I, I, I realized wow, there's something very, you know, there's something very seriously wrong with this prediction because this was released on March 26th and it's not trying to predict three months or a year. Well, it is trying to predict those things in the future or five years in the future. It's predicting days in the future and it's completely wrong. It's as if I said, you know, this hurricane, again, to come back to this, I, I say on August 31st, this hurricane is gonna hit and it's gonna be a category five in Miami on September 3rd, and the hurricane comes ashore on September 3rd, but it's a category one. So, so the, the, the predictions were just way off. And they, again, they were way off because they assumed this surge in infections had happened, 
that didn't seem to have happened. And we still don't quite know why that is. Um, uh, but, but one, you know, one good theory is that more people were infected earlier than we know. So the, again, that means that although there was a surge in infections in New York City in those days, ultimately fewer people wound up in the hospital than we realized. So, so it, was, it, was, it was my prodding at the University of Washington model day after day uh, that, that, again, I would say increased my public profile a little bit and increased people's questioning about this. Because those, those two models, the Imperial College model and the University of Washington model, led to the lockdown and are continuing to lead to the lockdown. And one of the, one of the amazing things that happened was the University of Washington continued to update its model. They, would, they, they updated it, uh, they've now updated, I believe, five times, possibly six times in the last, uh, you know, in the last month. Uh, but, the, but on April 5th, they changed the proje projections and they changed them from, uh, uh, from about 260,000 hospital beds needed to about 140,000 hospital beds needed. What was bizarre was even as they changed the model, that day, they didn't make it match what the actual numbers were in New York State that day. So even the new model was wrong at the time it was issued. And once I saw that, I thought to myself, this is really bad. You know, this is, a, this is, not, this is not okay. It's not okay that this incredibly important um, you know, predictor that's driving public policy isn't even being corrected to what we know is actually happening in New York State and other states at this time. Um, now the models, to be clear, have been more accurate about death counts. Uh, now that's, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, again, deaths are a lagging indicator. And again, and second of all, there is this issue about how we're coding for deaths. But the, what we should care about more than anything else is hospitalizations. Because hospital, both because hospitalizations are a leading indicator and tell us how serious the disease is you know for the general population and not just for a small group of elderly people who um, you know who are really at risk, but also because if you remember a month ago when the lockdowns began, the argument was we need to do this to save our healthcare system. It is not we cannot have a situation where every hospital is going broke is not going broke is overrun with COVID patients and can't do anything else, and we are working our doctors and nurses and medical staff to death. We can't have that happen. That's, and that's a totally reasonable way to look at it. The problem is the models predicted a destruction of the healthcare system that hasn't happened at all. Not even in New York City. In New York City got stretched, and it probably you know you can argue got stretched close to its limits, but the overflow capacity that was brought in, you know, the the the, the hospital ships and the field hospitals have never been full. So even by even New York City survived without being overrun. And elsewhere, this incredible paradox has happened, and this is something I was reporting on a lot a couple of weeks ago. I'd say at this point, it's beyond dispute, uh, where hospitals all over the country are emptier than they were a month or six weeks ago, and they are bleeding cash because they have postponed elective surgeries, because people aren't coming into their emergency rooms, because in some cases, really necessary surgeries are being postponed. Um, and so our hospital system believe it or not, is on the brink of collapse, not from COVID, but because we reacted to these models by shutting down a ton of stuff that hospitals need to be able to survive financially. And hospitals in the United States have already closed in the last month. They've laid off employees and some have, believe it or not, closed. So we are in the midst of the worst pandemic, supposedly, since the Spanish flu, and our hospitals are closing for lack of business. And once you realize that, you realize that how important it is that these models have been wrong. So, so I, would just, I would just urge everybody going forward to understand that um, you know, there's been many predictions of doom made in the last month. There's been the just wait two weeks predict. There's been the model predictions. There's been the wait two week predictions. There's been the second wave, which by the way is basically meaningless because a second wave could happen at any time. It could happen next fall or next or in the spring of 2021 or it could happen in 2 years. I mean, uh, you know, at what point do we do we say okay, there may ultimately be more deaths, even significantly more deaths from this, but we can't stay uh, you know, in our homes with no economy forever. Um, and and so, 
So it really is the models more than anything else that have driven this. And it's really important to understand how far from reality they've been. And that's, and that's what I've tried to do as much as anything else last month. Anyway, I thank you very much. Uh, oh, the one other point I would make is uh, about testing. Um, so yeah, that one thing that people have said is we need, we need many, many more tests. Well, the truth is we don't necessarily need many, many more tests to know if people are infected as long as they're not symptomatic or needing hospitalization. You don't necessarily care if you have the flu or not. If you're, you know, if you, if you feel lousy for a couple of days, uh, but you, you know, you know it's the flu and you know it's going to pass, you probably just stay home for those couple of days. The coronavirus tests are necessary if coronavirus is going to, you know, kill a lot of the, or you know, or seriously injure a lot of the people who get it, and we have good interventions for them. What is more important than knowing how many people are infected now? What is much more important is knowing how many people have been infected and recovered. And for that, it, you need a different kind of test, which is called an antibody test, which is a very simple test that just shows whether your body has produced an immune response to the virus. And these are, they're, they're, they're relatively cheap, they're relatively quick to do, and they've been conducted now in a number of states and in a number of countries, and almost universally, they have shown that many more people have been infected and recovered from the coronavirus than have active infections. Just yesterday, New York City uh, uh, published a number, New York State published a number for New York City showing that 21% of people in the city have been uh, infected and recovered. They have antibodies. And by the way, that number is probably low because it takes a little while to develop antibodies. So over the course of a couple of weeks, the number tends to rise. There's no guarantee of that, but it's likely. But in many other jurisdictions, there have been similar findings. In a, in a school in France, a single high school in France, 25% of students and teachers and, uh, and parents were infected. In Sweden, uh, in Stockholm, 11%. Uh, in, in, in California, it looks more like three or four percent. Uh, in you know, in Geneva, Switzerland, six percent. And again, that does not mean that there's not more you know virus out there that's gonna you know there's not gonna be more misery or or you know some people might be infected and ultimately die because you have to get to a much higher level than that to have what's called herd immunity where the virus basically has infected everybody it, it can. But those numbers suggest that the infection fatality rate is well below 1% and, and, and probably below a half percent. Uh, and, so, and so that suggests, again, not that this is not real and serious, but that it is less dangerous than we thought. But one of the bizarre things that's happened is that the people, the same people who made these models, many of the same people, um, you know, based on what now looks like faulty data and questionable assumptions, now that we're getting really hard data from the serology tests, from these antibody tests, they're pushing back and saying, oh, well, the test, those, those antibody tests may not mean anything. There may be false positives or, or there may, you know, this means that so many people have it and don't even know it that it's more dangerous. I mean, so, so, so that first question about false positives is a technical question, but this idea that there's antibody tests that, um, uh, that many people are infected and that's a bad thing and have recovered is a bad thing, that's just nonsense. There's, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's the opposite of reality and why people won't acknowledge that um, I don't know. So, 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 yeah, so let me leave you with the testing and the fact that by all accounts, there's now considerable evidence that the coronavirus has spread much more quickly or, and much more widely than we realized. And, and that's a good thing. The more of us, you know, whether in the United States or anywhere else who have gotten this and recovered from it, the better off we are. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm Alex Berenson, and I appreciate having had the chance to talk to you. Hello and welcome to the second half of our program with Alex Berenson. He's just given us an excellent talk on the failure of expert predictions and models. My name is John J. Miller. I'm director of the Dow Journalism Program here at Hillsdale College in Michigan. And Alex, welcome back and thanks for agreeing to take a few questions. John, it's a pleasure. I want to start with a big one, which is this. You've given us this great account of the problems of expertise and what experts have been saying. We're seeing millions of people on the unemployment rolls. You mentioned the problems hospitals are now facing. Have experts led us into making a gigantic public policy mistake? Well, you know, I, I don't think that's exactly the right way to think about this. You know, the experts provide data and predictions, but it's the job of political leaders, um, 
you know, executive, legislative, uh, and it's the job of all of us to try to think about the costs and benefits here. And again, there, there is a world in which the lockdowns make sense. Though, you know, that's a world in which a huge number of people are dying from this, and we really have no choice but to, you know, have a crippled society for a long time until we fix this. That, that is not the reality of what we're seeing here. Even the worst case projections don't fit that reality. And so it's up to all of us to, to uh, you know, to show some critical judgment here and not just hide out. And, and I can tell you, I mean, I don't know what your experience has been, but so again, my wife is a physician. She does treat COVID patients and we've made a conscious decision that we're gonna try to keep our family um, you know, functioning as normally as we can. We're going to go out with our kids. We're going to take them, you know, to the grocery store and stuff like that. They're not going to be terrified because I truly believe that the mental health impact on children here far, far outweighs any physical risk that they have. But, but most people we know aren't doing that at all. Most people are hunkered down, cowering in their homes. Uh, I, you know, I can only imagine they're watching uh, media outlets that are, that are putting the worst possible spin on all of this. And they're not looking, they're not exercising any critical judgment, looking at any scientific papers, looking at any government data for themselves. And, and I know that, you know, again, a lot of this stuff is, is stuff that is beyond, you know, the, the, an average person's understanding, certainly some of the technical stuff around the, you know, the biology of the virus, but anybody can, can look at a projection and look at what's actually happening that day and judge for himself whether those two numbers are the same and then ask what it means if they're not the same. And, and I just, I, I feel like we've all let ourselves down. What's a political leader supposed to do? Someone's listening to public health officials, listening to these studies, they're saying all kinds of different things. Some of them are very scary and frightening. You don't wanna make a mistake. You don't wanna make a decision that's gonna to lead to lots of deaths. How is a political leader supposed to judge between different kinds of expert opinion and, and land on the right course? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and here's the thing. The situation a month ago was different than it is now. Things looked scarier a month ago than they did now. We have more data. And we know that outside of New York City and possibly a couple other hotspots, there hasn't been a huge overrun. So, so when more data comes in, if you care about data, if you care about science, you should adjust your response. Beyond that, a political leader, you know, you're not just the, uh, the president of a 90-year-old in a nursing home. You're the president of a six-year-old in a school who, you know, who may not have, you know, who may have parents who are abusive or neglectful and being seen by a teacher that day is the only adult who's gonna see that child who can make sure that he or she is being taken care of and not being abused. You're the president of a small business owner who's invested his life in, a, you know, in getting a, his dry cleaning business opening this week and all of a sudden it can't exist anymore. It can't work anymore. He can't work because it's not essential. We have to make trades and and shutting the economy forever is not a fair trade or a good trade. And there are things we could do that would mitigate the harm to the most vulnerable people here, who again are overwhelmingly elderly. And, you know, and even within that population, the nursing home population is especially vulnerable. And if we focused our attention on protecting those people, if we had more temperature checks, if we tried to make sure that staff were being tested regularly for the coronavirus. If we, if we said, you know what, if there's any outbreak, we're gonna make sure that all these people get the best care we can give them. If we did that preferentially, maybe we'd be able to actually reduce the number of deaths and, uh, and at the same time have a functioning society. So were the lockdown and shutdown orders, were they, were they a good idea based upon the information that, that leaders had at that time, maybe not the best information or is the best information available, but maybe not good information? I mean, I think that's, an, that's a point that we can argue and will argue about for years. But to me, you know, it's more important right now, April 24th, what's the best thing to do going forward? What's the best thing to do now that we have studies out of Germany and other European countries showing that social distancing without a hard lockdown actually reduces the infectivity of the virus in a way that prevents these surges from happening? What's the best thing to do if there's increasing questions about whether or not the panic that a lockdown can cause in the days before it's actually happening, um, you know, but when it's announced, but before it happens, might be driving people to emergency rooms, might be causing them to trade the flu and coronavirus and other illnesses and actually gets them sicker and, uh, and you know, increases mortality, as may have happened in New York City last month. I, I, think, I think it doesn't really matter 
you know, it's it's for historians and you know, and I guess investigative reporters ultimately to chase down how the decisions that were made last month were made. I'm interested in making the right decision right now. So Alex, what's the right public policy solution right now? We're having this conversation on Friday, April 24th, and today the governor of Michigan just extended the stay-at-home order in our state. She, she loosened a few restrictions. There are a few new ones. But what would you recommend to the governor of Michigan, really any governor, if, if this person was to call you and say, uh, Alex Berenson, what should I do in my state? So uh, there's a couple harder answers to that, and there's a couple easy ones. Let me go with the harder ones first. I think in most states there, where there's not a hospital system crisis, which is almost every state, we can very quickly look at reopening offices, reopening retail, um, uh, and then looking, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks, maybe at hospitality, you know, at bars and restaurants, and then ultimately at, uh, you know, at at big events like uh, like concerts or sporting events. Um, there's very, very good data showing that uh, most of the transmission of this virus is intrafamilial or in hospitals and nursing homes, um, or to some extent on public transportation, that all the other methods of transmission are secondary. And so uh, so opening offices, opening retail, uh, opening construction, letting people get back to work makes sense. There are risks in it, but they, but it makes sense. But here's, here's two things that are very low risk that we should be doing right now, right as in today. We should be letting people go outside with no masks. And, you know, if they want to wear a mask, that's fine. But outdoor transmission is not a major vector or even a minor vector for this virus. It, it, there's very good data on this from many countries now. This is, is not how it spreads. And it's really bad for people's mental health, especially with summer coming, to deny them the chance to be outside. And it's really especially bad for children. And the second big thing we should do right now is figure out how to get schools reopened as quickly as possible. Because children and young adults are at very, very low risk for this. Again, the data is the same all over the world. The number one risk factor in, you know, in becoming Coming sick or dying from the coronavirus is age. Um, you know, there, there are a couple, there have been a couple of outlier cases where the media has focused on, you know, young children possibly dying. In some of those cases, it's not even clear whether coronavirus actually was a factor in the children's death. But remember, many children die every year from the flu. Um, you know, depending on the year, it could be 50 or 100 or 150. We don't shut society down for that. We don't shut schools down for that. It is unfair to children to deny them the chance at schooling. And in some cases, it's worse than that. Many children in the United States, 2,000 children in the United States approximately a year die from child abuse, um, which is, you know, far more than will ever die from coronavirus. And, and to, to lock these kids up in their homes where teachers who might be the only responsible adults in their lives can't see them, where they're stuck with abusive or drug using parents all day and, and where their whole family's under additional stress right now because the you know parents might be jobless, they're worried about paying the rent, is just beyond wrong. So we really should be looking at, focus, at, at reopening schools. Alex, we're running out of time. I got one more question for you, and it draws from your earlier book, your book from last year called Tell Your Children, which is about marijuana and mental health and violence, and it was the subject of one of the most read and debated issues of, of Imprimus, which is the newsletter of Hillsdale College ever, ever published. Uh, you wrote that book last year, and, and, and when, when, when we talk about coronavirus, of course, we're talking about physical health. Sometimes we don't always talk about the mental health implications of, of, of this disease and of the lockdown, the shutdown and so forth. With these orders, with staying at home, with people out of work, is there a greater threat now of drug abuse, whether it's, whether it's marijuana or opioids or something else? I, I think there's some evidence of that at this point. Um, you know, I, we, I don't know that we have hard statistics on that, and I'm reluctant to go past, you know, what the statistics say. There's some evidence, by the way, of an increase in domestic violence already, and again, of child abuse. Um, in, in terms of drug use, it's, it's quite reasonable to assume that, you know, both prescription pharmaceuticals like benzodiazepines and, you know, and drugs of abuse uh, like, like cannabis or, uh, you know, or alcohol or cocaine, um, would be would be things that people would turn to right now to try to relieve their stress. I'm not sure we have that data yet. Um, there's also considerable evidence that uh, economic deprivation drives up drug use, drives up suicides. Uh, you know, the opioid crisis is sometimes called the crisis of, de of deaths of despair. 
And it would be surprising if something similar didn't happen because of this. You know, perhaps because my wife is a psychiatrist, so she's a, you know, she's a doctor, a medical doctor, but she's also focused on mental health. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty attuned to this issue, and it, it's something we really should be talking about much more. Alex Berenson, thanks so much for talking to us about expert opinion and models and their failures. Thanks very much, Sean. And thanks to all of you for watching this program from Hillsdale College.